Thanks very much. Thanks for the great intro. Um, I hope you can understand my southern accent. <laughs> you know, it's great to be out here. Look, I've been looking around central Ohio. I've never been here before. I've been up north to Cuyahoga County and places like that, but never in the south here. It's beautiful. It really is. It's all your frozen over lakes and rivers and things like that. It's stunning. From a, from a South Sea island, it's pretty cool to be up here, <laughs> literally and figuratively. But okay, well thanks very much, um, thanks for coming along tonight, and I know it's a heat wave, so it's brought you out a bit. But the first thing everybody always asks me is why I should care, why do I come to the United States? And um, this is two, I'll just get this open. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I will need it. There's two basic reasons. The first is simple gratitude, because my country was only saved in World War II because of the huge sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway. And that memory is still strong in my country today. The second reason is related, but it's a little bit more selfish. Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. If freedom fails in the United States, if you lose your constitution and your economy, your liberty and your military superiority, which is going day by day, the bad guys of this planet will carve up the world amongst themselves. I'm talking Russia, Iran, China, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, North Korea and their crazed Islamic allies. They will take this world apart. There's only one thing that's stopping them now, and that is you. Now, I get emails all the time from people saying to me, look, if things turn bad in America, can I come and live in New Zealand? <laughs> I could start a consultancy, I really could. And I say, look, don't forget, forget that idea, you know. You come down to New Zealand, have a look around, you'll love the place, but it's not a refuge. Nowhere is a refuge. You know, just 1,500 miles to the north of my country are the beautiful Fijian Islands. A great tourist destination, but the Chinese are now training the Fijian military. They're building big hydroelectric dams on the islands. Tonga, nearby, is now virtually a Chinese client state. And that's happening right through the South Pacific. Just a few year, last year, a top, the Australian Minister of Defence was up in China for talks and a top Chinese general said to him, now is the time for Australia to choose. Do you stay under American protection or do you come under Chinese protection? If you are smart, you will choose China because we are the growing power in the region. Now he wouldn't have been arrogant enough to say that under Bush, even under Clinton, certainly not under Reagan. But he's arrogant enough to say it now because he sees the leadership coming out of your White House. And all around this world, your allies, from Germany to Canada to Britain to South Korea to Japan to Australia, Taiwan, all of them are freaking out because they see that your president seems to love the bad guys more than he loves them. And you saw how this went. You know, your, your allies are looking at you and they're thinking, well, what did President Obama do to Poland and Czechoslovakia? He took away their missile shield, exposed them to the Russians. They saw how he ignored the pleas of Georgia for help. They, saw, they see what he's doing to Israel. Israel has no friends left in the entire Middle East now because of the meddling of your president. And they may be forced to take desperate measures to defend themselves. And those measures could put us into World War III. All because of your president. So they're looking at this and they're thinking, well, what's the use of being an ally of America? And you saw where this was going when Obama called for help to go into Syria. All your allies were lining up, right? <laughs> couldn't, couldn't wait to get on board. Obama's latest adventure. And I'm not saying they should have gone by any means. It was madness. But that shows where American prestige is going. You know, you're Mr. Mr. Putin, who spent most of his life as a KGB officer trying to bring your country down, is now regarded as more of a statesman on the world stage than the leader of the free world is. And that's pretty, that's pretty significant, folks. 
You know, you look at my region in the Pacific, Japan is now rearming. Japan, which was never supposed to rearm after World War II, they're rearming because they cannot trust Obama to protect them from China and North Korea. You know, so you have a president who's got a Nobel Peace Prize in his trophy cabinet, cries peace all the time, and he's leading us into war. And it's a war that the good guys may not win. The old doctrine that served your country so well, Reagan's doctrine of peace through security, is going out the window. You lose your security, folks. You lose your peace very soon afterwards. So... I'm here promoting my new book. It's called um, The Enemies Within, Communists, Socialists and Progressives in the US Congress. Now that's a quite a provocative title in this day and age. And you'd have to be reasonably sure of your case if you didn't want to get laughed out of the country. My first book, Barack Obama and the Enemies Within, there's a few copies there, was nearly 700 pages. And I'll tell you what, I got real sick of lugging that around the country. I'll tell you. <laughs> Very heavy. And I promised that my, my next book would be shorter, would be smaller. But it's actually bigger. <laughs> because those bloody commies just kept on coming. <laughs> you know, the deeper I dug, the more I found. They're, it's riddled with them. And I couldn't leave out Dennis Kucinich, could I? <laughs> Or Marcy Kucinich, or Marcy, Ka or Marcy Kapta, yeah. and Sherrod Brown, you certainly couldn't leave them. Oh, 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 oh. So, they're all profiled in the book. The book is really about the two big secrets of modern communism. And the first secret, I think they borrowed from the devil, because we all know that the cleverest thing the devil ever did was to convince people he doesn't exist. And what have the communists done in the last 20 years, folks? They don't exist, right? And if they do, they're not a threat, are they? Unfortunately, that's not quite correct. The other big secret of modern communism, and this is hardly ever written about in all the thousands of books on communism, the big secret of modern communism is the ability, the ability of a tiny Marxist-Leninist party, maybe only a few hundred comrades strong, to influence and even control the legislative process in their country. In other words, to write the laws that you live by. So what I'm saying here is, folks, that less than 20,000 card-carrying Marxists in your country, Democratic Socialists of America, Communist Party USA, a few others, less than 20,000 card-carrying Marxists are dictating the legislative agenda of the Democratic Party, which is writing laws for more than 300 million Americans. Now that's a very small tail wagging a very big dog, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit far-fetched, isn't it? You know? But I ask you, you know, when these people stand for public office, which they occasionally do, the communists will get sort of 137 votes or something. And people laugh at them. You know, what, what possible influence could these people have? But is it just the number of votes you get that determine your political influence? How many votes did Al Capone ever get in Chicago? <laughs> Telling me he didn't run that town? How many votes does the mafia get in Sicily these days? Telling me they don't run that province? Bribery, corruption, intimidation, indoctrination, backroom deals, thuggery vote fraud. There's a whole bunch of ways that small dedicated groups can manipulate much larger groups from behind the scenes. And that's what Marxism-Leninism is all about. Spe specifically the Leninism side. Because that's about taking power and holding power. Less than 2,000 Bolsheviks took over Russia in 1917. A country of 140 million people at the time. They've had a hundred years of practice since then to refine their techniques. And they are real good at it, folks. It's always been small groups that have taken over countries, not big groups. So the mechanism, and this should resonate in Ohio, the mechanism they do this is through the labour unions. 
Now, you were very lucky in this country for a long time because your unions, your AFL-CIO, was run by hardcore anti-communists like Lane Kirkland and George Meany. They kept the Reds at bay. But in 1995, there was a coup. That was the year that Democratic Socialists of America, you all know Bob Fabrakis, I'm sure, around here? Yeah. He's, he's, one, he's one of them. That was the year that they took over the AFL-CIO. That was the year they put their man, John Sweeney, in as president, and now their protege, Richard Trumka, does the job for them. The first thing they did at that point was abolish the anti-communist clause from the AFL-CIO's constitution, and the Marxists came flooding back. They now control every major labour union in this country, AFSCME, NEA, SEIU, you name it, they run it. Anybody who's a union member in this room is paying dues to Marxists. You can count on that. So what that did was effectively give the Marxists control of the Democratic Party. Ever wondered why since 1995 the Democrats have veered further and further left? And the old moderates like Joe Lieberman have been purged from the party. That was a plan, folks. They talk about it in their publications. Getting rid of the moderates, getting rid of the old southern conservatives. So, because if you control the labour unions, folks, there's hardly a Democrat at any level, any elected Democrat, Democrat who doesn't owe his job to the unions. For get out the vote, for money, for manpower, even for vote fraud. The unions are king. And if they get you elected, folks, you do what they tell you. If they tell you to propose certain legislation, you do it. If they tell you to put a certain candidate forward, you do it. That's how small groups of Marxists, less than 20,000, by taking over the labour unions, have taken control of the Democrats. Every major policy plank from today's Democratic Party, from socialisation of student loans to green jobs to all the ones you see around you, they can all be traced back to the Communist Party USA and Democratic Socialists of America. All of them. But that's still a bit academic, a bit far-fetched. So I want to give some actual examples of how this process works in reality. Because it is a process, folks. It's a scientific process. Now, the first example I want to give, I refer back to my own country, New Zealand, because this is where I discovered this. Back in 1984, my country elected a socialist Labour government, equivalent of your Democrats. The first thing they did was to ban nuclear warships from our harbours. Now, we had a military alliance with you people, the Australian-New Zealand-United States Military Alliance, ANZUS. When we enacted that legislation, ANZUS became dead. You couldn't send your ships into our harbours, folks. We were no longer your allies. So how come, at the height of the Cold War, could a pro-Western, pro-American country like New Zealand so willingly turn its back on the Western Alliance? Turn its back on a country who had saved our bacon only a generation before. Well, this is how it was done, people. A few years after that, I had the privilege over several months of interviewing a New Zealander who had infiltrated the New Zealand Communist Party for our security intelligence services, the equivalent of your FBI. He was a communist spy inside the unions. Inside the com he was a government spy inside the Communist Party. In 1983, he and three genuine comrades were given the greatest honour any communist could enjoy. They were sent to Moscow to train at Lenin's Institute for Higher Learning on Lenin Gradsky Prospect, the Lenin School. This was not a small place, folks. This was six and a half thousand students at any one time. Many of them on seven-year courses, many of them with one-to-one -one tutelage. This was a training academy for the future world communist leadership. They were all taught Russian history, they were taught trade union building and racial agitation and espionage techniques, but the most important thing they were taught was how to take Moscow's policies, 
back to their own country and by using the labor unions and the peace movement and even the churches to turn Moscow's policies into their own government's policies. And they did this countless times throughout the West and throughout the Third World, dictating policy in all sorts of countries. Now, this was a time of the massive anti-nuclear marches in Europe. Hundreds of thousands of people were marching through Rome and Berlin and Paris. They banned the bomb banners, get America out of Europe, disband NATO, no nukes. Hundreds of thousands of them. And there was a real fear in some circles that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which you guys are the linchpin of, might break up. And the Soviets were, of course, funding and directing all this peace movement stuff because they wanted to destroy NATO. Because that would give them control of Europe. And I'll tell you straight, back in 1983, just as in 2014, your military and your military alliances are Moscow's number one target. Number one. Because they know if they can take your military down and isolate you from your friends, which is happening right now, no one stands in their way. They get everything they want. Who's going to stop them, folks? Iceland? Italy? France? There's only one force that can stop, stop them, folks, and that's your country. So they need to take you down. That's why Mr. Putin, despite this little spat over... Syria loves Mr. Obama because no one has done more to destroy your military than this current president. Absolutely his number one priority. He is a man who has worked with pro-Soviet, anti-US military communists his entire life. From Frank Marshall Davis as a young man to Alice Palmer in Chicago, a member, a leading member of the World Peace Council, the Soviet's number one front, a leading member of the International Association of International Organization of Journalists, another Soviet front, went to East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and the Soviet Union many times, and she got Obama started in politics in Chicago. Not to mention Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn and many others. So the number one, Obama even did his thesis on nuclear on nuclear disarmament at, Ox at, at um, Columbia. This is his baby, folks. The most important thing Obama said in his entire first term of office when he was caught off mic in South Korea, thought he was not being listened to, talking to Dmitry Medvedev, the then Russian president. When I get re-elected, I'll have more flexibility to deal with you. Yes, said Mr. Medvedev. I understand. I will pass your message on to Vladimir. We are with you. That tells it all, folks. That is the agenda. Now, so the Soviets had this big game going on. Massive game going on. They were thinking, well, we're subtle. We're chess players. And they are. How about, to destroy NATO, we take away another country outside of Europe, out of the Western Alliance, and use the psychological and propaganda value of that to take out NATO, to break up NATO. So they picked on New Zealand because we're small, progressive, and we sort of think we punch above our weight on the world stage. People listen to us. And also the communists controlled our unions, our peace movement, and had heavily infiltrated our Labour Party. So they're thinking, well, we want to get New Zealand out of Anzus. How are we going to sell this? Because New Zealanders love America. We can't use the anti-American card, the anti-gringo card, like we would in Latin America. How are we going to do it? And when I say sell, folks, I am not exaggerating. If you think American corporations are great at sales and marketing, they could learn a thing or two from Moscow. When they target a country, or even a state, like, like this one, or Pennsylvania, or whatever... They bring in all their experts. They bring in their historians, their religious experts, their psychology experts, their marketing experts, their slogan experts, even their sporting experts. They know the culture in this state better than you do. You do. They know your sports, your racial makeup, your economic makeup, your history, your culture, your peculiarities. They know it all, folks. 
because they need to be able to sell their message to you. So they thought New Zealand, they like to think of themselves as a world leader because of our progressive, their progressive record. Their record in leading the world in women's voting and social welfare and all these progressive, me progressive methods, uh, messages. So, okay, they brought their people together and thought, we can't use the anti-American card. This has to be a pro-New Zealand thing. This is going to be Kiwi standing up for peace. New Zealanders standing against the nuclear arms race. New Zealanders striking independent foreign policy course. All pro-New Zealand stuff. So these four delegates went back to New Zealand. They had a plan. They had secret meetings with the Labour Party, with the peace movement and the unions. They mounted a public campaign and in a few short months that legislation was in front of the New Zealand Parliament and was signed off and your ships were no longer welcome in our harbours. And Anzus was dead. And it's still dead today. <coughs> and I'll tell you, next time you talk to a Kiwi, now that you know what the accent sounds like, <laughs> okay, you say to them, hey, that anti-nuclear thing back in the 80s, what do you think of that? I guarantee you most of them will say, yeah, yeah, we did it. They'll puff out their chest with pride. We did it. We stood up for peace. We stood against the arms race. I think it's so cool. Hardly one of them in four million people has any idea that those policies they so love were designed by the KGB at Lenin's Institute for Higher Learning. A whole country was suckered. whole country <coughs> still suckered today. But could this happen in America? If I'd said that ten years ago, what would you have said? No way. No. Nah. Dreamer. Unrealistic. Go home. Okay, well, I want to tell a little story. I'll give some examples. So first, I want to tell a little story, then I'll give the first of a couple of examples. Tell me, are there any Vietnam veterans in the room? Wow, well, I knew there would be some. Thank you. Okay, well, you think of your veterans when I tell a story. First, <coughs> last year, it might have been 2012 actually. The Communist Premier of Vietnam came to visit Mr. Obama in Washington. They held a little meeting. Now during that meeting, Mr. Obama made a statement that caused some controversy on the conservative blogosphere. He said it's a well-known fact that Ho Chi Minh, Uncle Ho, who was the Communist leader of Vietnam during the war, was a huge fan of Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. Can you believe that? Well, there's a grain of truth in that, but the grain of truth tells me where Obama's coming from, because Obama was raised at the knee of a professional communist propagandist. And this tells you something about Obama, because this is a real story. Now, back in World War II, Uncle Ho and his communist guerrillas were fighting the Japanese invaders in Vietnam. And they were getting help from your OSS, your Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of your CIA. Now, incidentally, the OSS was shot full of communists because while Bill Donovan, the man who set it up, deliberately recruited veterans of your Abraham Lincoln brigades, the American communists who fought in the Spanish Civil War for Stalin because he wanted people with European military experience. And those communists were never fully cleaned out when they set up the CIA. Your agency was penetrated from day one. Now also note, the American communists didn't fight in Spain as the Vladimir Lenin Brigade or the Karl Marx Brigade. They were the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Just as the communists had an Abraham Lincoln school in Chicago where Frank Marshall Davis taught and a Jefferson school in New York. They love to hide their revolution behind your political icons. Do it all the time. Obama loves to do it. So, Uncle Ho and the OSS got rid of the Japanese. But the next step was to get rid of, to get rid of the French colonialists who returned to reclaim Vietnam after the war. It was a, it was a French colony. Now, Uncle Ho was thinking, well, I want to get the Americans to help me get rid of the French. Because he knew that FDR didn't like the French very much. He wrote a letter to FDR asking for military aid. But he knew to get American public opinion on his side, which he would need, 
He wasn't going to get that if he went around the country talking about socialist revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat. But he might get it if he went around talking about Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, which is what he did. Did all over the country, did a huge rally in downtown, Han downtown Hanoi, OSS officers through the crowd. Thomas Jefferson is my revolutionary idol. He is the man I model my mission on. The American Declaration of Independence is a model for Vietnam's revolution. All designed to suck in American public opinion. Fidel Castro did exactly the same thing in Cuba until he was strong enough to openly come out as a communist. So it was a propaganda ploy, folks. That was all it was. And Obama was repeating it. Now, if FDR died and a real Democrat named Harry Truman became president and he was nowhere near as stupid. He basically told Uncle Ho to get lost. Frank Marshall Davis regularly used to write columns in his little communist newspaper in Hawaii calling Harry Truman a fascist. Did you know he was a fascist, folks? Well, he must be because he opposed Stalin and he opposed communism. So therefore, he is a fascist, right? That's how the communists think. That's why they call you the names they do. So that failed. That ploy failed. But you can see the techniques they use. Now, during that time, during that little tete tape with the Premier of Vietnam, Obama made another statement which I thought was even more significant. He said that Americans are going to have to get on board with repairing the damage done during the Vietnam War. Now what that means, of course, is you have to send your money to Vietnam to repair the damage done by bombing and Agent Orange by your troops fighting off the North Vietnamese communist invasion. Now there's a little communist group in this country called the Committees of Correspondence, named after your Committees of Correspondence and the Revolutionary War, for democracy and socialism. It's a break away from the Communist Party USA, has 300 members. Its most famous member is Angela Davis. You know, the Afro haircut and the murder charges back in the 70s. Hardcore group. Their favourite communist country is Vietnam. They're always sending delegations over there. A few years ago, they set up a little front group called the Agent Orange Reconciliation Campaign. Now, the leader of that is married to the, North, the Vietnamese ambassador to your country. She's a woman called Merle Ratner, hardcore communist. The purpose of this, they also set up one in Australia as well, a similar group led by the communists in Australia. The purpose of this group is to lobby your Congress to pay reparations to Vietnam for the damage your troops did during that war. I'm a bit old-fashioned, folks, but aren't reparations supposed to be what the bad guys pay to the good guys? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that how it works? Yeah. So why do you have to pay reparations to the country that started the war? How does that figure? Now, they've got a whole bunch of congressmen on board with this. They support several delegations from Vietnam to appear in front of your Congress to beg for money. Even had a little girl with no legs in a wheelchair to tug the heartstrings of your rep representatives. Look at this poor girl. This is Agent Orange. This did this to her. We have to fix this. They've got your congressman. They've got, they've got um, John Conyers out of Michigan. Sheila Jackson Lee's on board. <laughs> surprise, surprise. They've got Al Franken. They've got Tom Harkin. Who just told you how wonderful Cuba's education system is. Big profile of him in my book. All these people have profiled in my book. They've got um, Jeff Merkley out of Oregon. they got Bob Filner while he was still a congressman. Bob Filner was a congressman out of San Diego. He then became mayor of San Diego, and you might have heard of his difficulties recently. Oh. Filthy Phil, I think they call him, or something like that. Filthy Bob, or whatever. But whatever. He was paid, he was sent to Vietnam in 2009 to negotiate these reparations. That trip was paid for by the International Association of Democratic Lawyers an old Soviet front now run by the Cuban and Greek communists. So a communist front paid 
a serving US Democratic congressman to go to Vietnam to negotiate reparations from your country to theirs. Vilna, incidentally, is the son of the former head of the Pennsylvania Communist Party, just by the way. So you're sending your money to that country to bail out their veterans. How many of you people in this room know somebody suffering the ill effects of Agent Orange? One of your veterans or your veterans' families? How long do they take to get their money, folks? Hmm. How long do they have to struggle with your government to get a pittance? Living in homeless shelters and hospitals, with children with all sorts of congenital defects, how long did they have to wait to get money from the government who sent them over there? Same in my country, same in Australia. Yet your president seems to think it's appropriate to send your taxpayers' money to bail out their veterans. And that bill is still before your Congress now. And it won't even go to their veterans, folks. It'll go to the Vietnamese government to do with what they want. How do you feel about that one? No. It's happening right now, people. 300 communists are orchestrating your congressmen and senators to do this right now. <coughs> but I'll give you a bigger example now. And if you've been following the news, some of you might have heard of this because it's a bit bigger. It's called Obamacare. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Well, good to see you keeping up. Sorry. <laughs> okay? Good on you. Now look, I know that Obamacare is not fully socialised healthcare yet. It's not single payer. Yeah. Yeah. But we all know where it's going, folks. Yeah. Harry Reid's admitted it. Jan Schakowsky's admitted it. It's going to single payer. Now, I just want to make a point because I still get people defending single payer or they'll say pre-existing conditions or the uninsured. and It's fear. This is what they do in Europe. This isn't really socialism, folks. Look, I come from a country that's had socialised healthcare my entire life. And I'll tell you what, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks big time. Everything you've ever heard about it is true and worse. And I'll say something here, look, because these people say to me, oh, you know, socialised healthcare is alright. The big word they all forget is quality. They assume that quality is going to be the same, folks. Now, is there any more important word than quality when it comes to your health care or the health care of your children? Makes all the difference, right? Now, if you're in a free market health care system, and I know it's not free market here, but at least there's strong elements of it remaining, you're a customer, right? And you business folk in this room, how do you treat your customers? Pretty darn good if you're still in business, right? Mm -hmm. You love your customers. You make friends with your customers. That's the American way. And if you're a doctor, your patient is your customer. And the longer your customer stays happy and healthy and productive, the more holidays they can afford to give you. Is that correct? That's how it works, isn't it? But if you're in a, a single power system, the government pays all the bills. So the budget is this big, but the needs are infinite. Health needs are infinite, folks, but the budget is fixed. So what do you then become? You become a liability. You business folks, how do you treat your liabilities? You eliminate them, right? As soon as you can. Now look, you talk about death panels, like there's going to be death panels that decide who gets treatment. We don't talk about death panels, folks. Every doctor, every head of every department in our hospitals is his own death panel. You imagine being head of a, the oncology department in a New Zealand hospital and your budget is, say, $20 million a year for chemotherapy or whatever it is. It's a fixed budget, folks. You've got unlimited patients with unlimited needs. You've got a 75-year-old guy in this bed with prostate cancer who needs $200,000 worth of treatment to extend his life two or three years. You've got a seven-year-old girl in this bed with leukaemia who needs $200,000 worth of treatment to save her life and maybe bring her into adulthood. Your budget's fixed, folks. You can only treat one of them. What are you going to do? What would you do? 
<laughs> we don't talk about death panels, folks. We know that if you're old and not paying taxes and you're a useless eater, you do not get the same level of treatment as someone who's young and productive and paying taxes. You just don't. How can it work any other way? You've got a limited budget, unlimited needs. You have to ration. You have to tell some people, sorry sir, we're not going to treat you, but we will give you lots of morphine and you will die comfortably. That's how it works in Australia and New Zealand and Europe and Canada, which is why so many people come down here. But the laws of economics don't apply in America, right? It's going to be different here, right? It can't be different, folks. It's just logic. It's just how governments work. Now, the father of the single-payer or socialised healthcare movement in this country is a man called Quentin Young. Now, he's a, he's a retired physician from Chicago. He's pushing 90 now. And in my darker moments, which are many, I often wish he'd gone to live in Canada 20 years ago, because he may not be with us now. <laughs> but he is, and he's been pushing this for more than 50 years now. He set up physicians for a national health plan. He's worked with the AMA. He's worked with Canadian doctors. He's worked with people like John Conyers to get single-payer legislation in front of your Congress on several occasions. But it was always voted down. But in 2009, with the Affordable Health Care Act, they finally started to make progress. And it's not surprising that the progress came under Mr Obama because for many years in Chicago, Quentin Young was Mr. Obama's personal physician and friend and political mentor. Big picture of them together in my book. He openly claims credit for indoctrinating Obama into single-payer health care, says he was a huge fan of single-payer when he was an Illinois state senator and nobody paid any attention to what he said. Quentin Young was a 40-year veteran of the Communist Party USA, 40 years. In the early 70s, he and three other doctors went to North Vietnam to volunteer their services to the communist government when they were trying to kill people in this room. That's how patriotic Mr. Young is. He's a leading member now of Democratic Socialists of America, and that is the organisation behind Obamacare. 7,000 members, several here in, in, this, in this town, Simone Morgan, Bob Fredrakis, etc. They are the leaders of this movement. They talk of this been their number one priority for 40 years now. They've been promoting it for 40 years. They promoted it through the AFL-CIO, which they control, and also through the Congressional Progressive Caucus, 80 members of your house, which was set up by Democratic Socialists of America and Bernie Sanders. They've been pushing it, folks all the way and through all the other organisations they control. And they're openly boasting in their publications right now that Obamacare is going to fail. It's going to fail, folks, but that's great because then they're going to blame the insurance companies and the greedy doctors and single payer comes next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. They won't be blaming Obama for it. Now, to prove a little point, just before the last election, the Obama campaign released a little video designed to mock Mitt Romney. The gist of it was this. Hey Mitt, guess what? You know how you, you hate Obamacare, you want to abolish it? Well we got a joke, there's a joke's on you. Because the man who designed it for us, the architect of it, that's their words, that was John McDonough, former Massachusetts state legislator, Harvard academic. He designed Obamacare, but and guess what? He was the man who designed Romney Care too. So ha ha. Now it's true, McDonough did design both systems. Mitt Romney got a bill out of the Massachusetts State Legislature, which is shot full of Democratic Socialists of America supporters. And he tried to modify it, push it back, make it less socialist. But a compromise was reached and he got his name stuck to it. What the video did not say was that John McDonough was the Boston chair of Democratic Socialists of America 
a Marxist. A Marxist designed Obamacare. The same Marxist group promoted it for 40 years, and another member of that group personally indoctrinated your president into it. 7,000 members, folks, and they're about to socialise between one-sixth and one-quarter of your economy and change your country forever. If you let them do it. And you cannot let them do it, people. Because there's no way back. Now, I want to give another example, which is very, very much in the news right now. And that's comprehensive immigration reform. <laughs> otherwise known as amnesty. Now, you have people in the GOP, like Eric Cantor, and Lindsey Graham, and John McCain, and Marco Rubio, who tried to tell you this is good for the Republican Party. Because all those legal immigrants, when they get citizenship and voting rights, they're all going to become good little Republicans, right? They're going to flock to the cause. Conservative to the core, all of them. Look, this is delusional, folks. We know that 90% of blacks in this country have voted Democrats more than 50 years. And they ain't changing in a hurry. 80% of the Jews in this country have voted Democrat for more than 100 years. They ain't going to change in a hurry. Maybe in 20 or 30 years, some of the Latinos, etc. will change. They're social conservatives, most of them. But we've got two and a half years, folks, to save this country. Two and a half years. And I'll explain why. But two and a half years ain't going to... The change won't happen fast enough. But the real... And I'll just say, too... Some people ask me, why do these Republicans try and tell us this stuff? Well, the Chamber of Commerce has spent $1.7 billion in the last 10 years promoting amnesty. What do you think they want, folks? Cheap labour to run their factories and farms. And the Republicans who are most ardent about this are the ones closest to big business in the Chamber of Commerce. All they're looking at is profits for their members. Damn your border security, damn your national integrity, and damn the laws of your land. Their profits come first, right? Mm -hmm. That's their view. The other people who used to think it was wonderful to supply Hitler before World War II, who used to send scrap metal to Japan, they're real patriots, folks. Now, but the real driver of this is the hard left. That's their baby, ultimately. And this movement started back in California in the 1950s with a man called Bert Corona. He was a member of the Communist Party, also a member of the Democratic Party. He set up the Viva Kennedy Clubs in the early 60s, the first organised effort to bring Latinos into the Democratic Party. He also set up a huge network of immigrants' rights support networks around the southwest and southern California. The purpose of those was to encourage immigrants across the border to get them work in the fields, get them green cards and eventual citizenship, citizenship and voting. The aim was to change the demographics of the Southwest and California. And it was an organised plan, folks. Organised. Corona trained hundreds of people to carry on the work for him. Three of them are still very prominent today. One of them is a man called Antonio Villagrosa who was until recently mayor of Los Angeles, a hardcore Marxist, used to go down to Cuba to cut sugarcane for Castro with the Vince Ramos brigades, the same people that weather underground terrorists used to go down with. Villa Garosa turned Los Angeles into a sanctuary city. He forbade the LAPD from enforcing immigration laws, and the illegals flooded into that city, hundreds of thousands of them. Another member of this little group, and they all work closely together, all Corona disciples, was Gil Cedillo, until recently the head of the California State Senate. He was another hardcore Marxist. He got the DREAM Act pushed through in California a couple of years ago, which gave all sorts of rights to the children of undocumented workers. He's the leader of the immigrants' rights movement in Southern California. The other member of this little group, another Marxist, is a Maria Elena Durazzo. She is the leader of the California AFL-CIO. She has organised huge, union-driven, 
Latino registration drives and get out the vote efforts that have put hundreds of thousands of, of new Democratic votes on the California rolls, Latino votes. She has changed the entire voting patterns of that state. Now California, which once used to be reddish, purplish, is now solidly blue. Even Orange County, once the most conservative county in the entire United States, is now purple. All as a result of immigration coordinated by the communists. All of it. And the prize is very simple. California, your most popular state, has the most electoral college votes of any state, which is hugely important when it comes to presidential elections. That was the plan. Now we'll go to Arizona. A man, a politician, died in Arizona in 2012. Most successful politician out of that state in decades. I bet you've never heard of him. Called Lorenzo Torres. He was the head of the Communist Party USA's Latino Commission. And his job was much like Bert Corona, was to set up immigrants' rights support networks through the entire Southwest, from Texas to Nevada, New Mexico to Colorado. And also to coordinate campaigns against any attempt to crack down on illegal immigration. He led the big campaign against SB70 in Arizona a couple of years ago, a battle he fortunately lost. Um, Torres also set up a movement in Tucson and, and Phoenix, which has given your Congress, your House of Representatives, three Communist Party supporters out of Arizona. One of the reddest states in the Union has three Communist Party supporters in their congressional delegation. Raul Grijalva, Ed Pastor, and the freshman Kirsten Cinema. All done by Lorenzo Torres, all of them profiled in my book. Now, the leader of the movement today, right now, and I guarantee you've seen him on TV wearing a purple shirt, leading an immigration rally, that's Alisao Medina, until recently an executive vice president of the SEIU union, the largest union in your country and the one with the biggest Latino membership. He is the man behind the bill that went through your Senate. He's been using his union members across the country to pressure your Republican congressman for the last few months to get a bill through the House. He works closely with Raul Grijalva, works very closely with Luis, Luis Gutierrez, who's driving this in the House. He's a rep from Illinois, a former member of the pro-Cuban, Marxist-Leninist, Puerto Rican Socialist Party, by the way. Um, Alice Medina is a card-carrying member of Democratic Socialists of America. He's a big-time supporter of the Communist Party USA, and he served on Obama's Latino Advisory Commission. He is a man leading this movement right now, full-time. And to prove a little something, which organisation 20 years ago was leading the charge in America to crack down on illegal immigration? The unions. The unions. They were constantly lobbying Congress to increase penalties for anybody caught employing illegal aliens. Because they saw illegal immigrants as unfair competition for union members that would drive wages and conditions down. Very logical. Which organisation in 2014 is leading the charge to legalise illegal immigrants? The unions. The unions. Why the change, folks? Numbers. Well, that's part of it. That's a small part of it. But the big change came in 1995. Because that was the year that Democratic Socialists of America took over the AFL-CIO. Before that, the AFL-CIO was there to promote the interests of its members. After that point, it was there to promote socialist revolution. And illegal immigrants are real bad for union workers, but they are great for socialist revolution. The AFL-CIO is quite happy to sell out its own membership because a revolution comes first. And it's not easy to get union members to vote against their own interest, people. Uh, Alice o. Medina campaigned for several years inside the AFL-CIO and the union movement, and at the big AFL-CIO convention 
in Louisiana in 2000, he engineered the change in policy from anti-illegal immigrant to pro-illegal immigrant. A Marxist changed their policy. And your union members in this country are being sold out ever since. Right now. They've been suckered. Now why does Medina want this though? What's the big deal? As you said, union members are part of it. But that's only a tiny part of it. Medina let the cat out of the bag at a big progressive conference in Washington DC a couple of years ago. I quote him in my book, I've got him on tape. He got up in front of the comrades and said, the number one priority for our movement is an immigration bill. We have to give citizenship and voting rights to our 11 million undocumented workers. And did he talk about compassion or reinvigorating the economy or giving immigrants a break or reuniting families? Not a word. All he said was this. In 2008, Latinos voted overwhelmingly for Obama and progressive candidates. If we stand by these people and get them citizenship and voting rights, they will stand by our movement. That will give us at least 8 million more democratic votes. That will give us a governing majority, not just for the next few election cycles, but for the foreseeable future. In other words, a democrat, one-party state. 8 million votes, folks. Texas goes blue. You take the electoral college votes from Texas, your second most popular state, combine them with the electoral college votes from California, which they've already got, it's mathematically impossible for the Republicans to ever win another election. Ever. That's it. One party state, folks. And if you think the Dem Democrats are arrogant now, you imagine what they'd be like with the Republicans permanently out of power. Wouldn't be just the IRS that come after you with, folks. This wouldn't turn into France or Germany. This would be like Venezuela very quickly and then Cuba. Because that is the plan. It's all about the votes, folks. Nothing else. And you have people in the Republican Party telling you this is good for the GOP. <laughs> they are not only betraying the Republican Party, they are betraying their country. And they need to be primaried out as soon as possible and given the message. Now, I want to say the book is also about the individuals, because individuals count. They are accountable for what they do. Now, anybody in this room, not counting military, who's ever applied for a federal government job and is willing to admit it, <laughs> okay. Now I know, did you have to get an FBI security clearance, sir? I never even got past the application. Okay. But I know if you are serious, you get an FBI security check, right? Oh, yeah. And they go through your underwear drawers. <laughs> your childhood background, your any dodgy uncles you might have, your education, foreign travel, any any drug habits anything because they need to be able to trust you folks because you might have state secrets under your control one day or you might be guarding a nuclear facility or even the president they have to be able to trust you but what happens if you're a run, young radical like Dennis Kucinich, Kucinich who hangs around with the communist party and has union friends who can get him into congress what happens if you're someone like that and you get put on the armed services committee or the Homeland Security Committee, or the Science and Technology Committee. Or, you know, you have access to all sorts of state secrets. You have the ability to influence public policy on a grand scale. How much security clearance do you need for that, folks? Zero. Because the people are supposed to vet the candidates, right? And the media is supposed to help them do it, right? How's that one working out for you? <laughs> Look, if you were a foreign intelligence officer from North Korea or China or Venezuela or Cuba and you had union friends and communist friends in this country who had the ability to put one of their people into your Congress or your Senate and get them any information you wanted, would you be doing your job if you didn't take advantage of that? 
Do you think those intelligence officers who have to succeed if they don't want to end up in the gulag, do you think they wouldn't be trying to drive a huge hole, get their people through that huge hole in your national security? Look, you have people in this country, folks. You know, Kucinich had a 20-year history with the Communist Party. Marcy Kapta was endorsed and supported by Democratic Socialists of America. Same with Sherrod Brown. You had Mary Jo Kilroy from this region, a card-carrying member of Democratic Socialists of America in your Congress for two years. You've got John Conyers, 50-year history with the Communist Party. Barbara Lee, huge long history with the Communist Party. You've got um, Tammy Baldwin out of Wisconsin, long-time supporter, long-time member of the support network for the Colombian narco-terrorists. You got Jerry, you got Jerry Nadler, Danny Davis, Jan Schakowsky, all card carrying members of Democratic Socialists of America. All Communist Party supporters as well. You got Eddie Bernice Johnson out of Texas, Communist Party supporter. Raul Grahalva, Communist Party supporter. Patty Murray out of Washington State, Communist Party supporter. You got a whole bunch of them folks. You got you got Judy Chu out of California. Beautifully coiffured, lovely hair, lovely clothes, softly spoken, head of the Congressional, Congress, Congressional Progressive Caucus, head of the Asia Pacific Caucus in your Congress, goes to China all the time. When she says, she says, I'm coming home, the Chinese call her their representative in your Congress. Back in 1979, the Communist Workers' Party in this country, a hardcore Maoist Chinese group, got in a public gun battle in the streets of Greensboro, North Carolina, a machine gun battle in the streets, five people killed, and Judy Chu was one of their people, folks. She still works with former members of the Communist Workers' Party right now, and I document it in my book. You have members of the Congressional Black Caucus like Marcia Fudge who go down to Cuba on a regular basis to confer with the Castro brothers and I quote Raul Castro where he talks about how these people talk to him about how they can change US policy to soften trade and travel restrictions on Cuba so they can send more spies to your country. What do you call it folks where people go from your country to an enemy country to work with them to change policy in your country. Is that a misdemeanor, folks? But this is happening every day. This is nothing unusual. There's at least a hundred members of your house and probably 20 members of your Senate who would not pass a basic security test to clean the toilets at any military base in your country. And neither would your president. Could that be an issue? Do you think the, con the Russians would tolerate a hundred pro-Americans in their Duma? Or the Cubans would tolerate a hundred pro-Americans in their parliament? But that's what you're doing, folks, right now, and you're electing them. Right now. I profile 51 of them, in the 51 members of the House in, in my book, and 14 of your senators. It shouldn't be there. But I don't want to depress you folks with any of that. <laughs> or, or, or bring you down in any way. Look, this is how I see it. If I thought there was no hope for America, I'd be back in my beautiful New Zealand right now, building bunkers and stocking up on baked beans. And I'm, not, I'm not mocking prepping, believe me. But look, this is how it is. In 2008, the left thought they had a slam dunk. They had the House, the Senate, and their man in the White House. All their ducks were finally in a row, and the agenda was written out. They were going to steamroll middle America out of existence once and for all. They were going to take out the great Satan, folks. Forty years of hard work was coming to fruition. They were going to take you down. But in 2009 and 2010, something miraculous happened. You guys should know what it is. You guys. You guys. You came out of nowhere. Where were you? 
at home. You and Glenn Beck, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you and Glenn Beck and thousands of people like you came out of left field, or should I say right field, yeah. <laughs> and you snuck up on them, folks. You blogged and you marched and you emailed and you rallied and you agitated and you put some spine into the GOP and you, you guys, took back the House in 2010. Yeah. And what did that do? That brought the agenda of the left to a grinding, screeching halt. They had it, folks. They were breaking out the vodka. Who was going to stop them? John Boehner. <laughs> Who was going to stop them? No one. And you snuck up on them and took it off them. And some of you wonder why they hate you. Why they call you dirty names. They hate you because you stopped them, folks. You saved your country. Could you imagine had you not done that? The whole agenda of the left would be in now. Obamacare would be locked in. The 8 million illegals would be voting in 2014. Cap and trade, card check, the whole lot would be in now. And where would you be then, people? Where would you be? Now, you also did something very important. Because you kick-started the second American Revolution. I've been to 31 of the 57 states, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and I've addressed meetings in the bluest of the blue, 600 people in Michigan, 500 people in, Ma in Massachusetts. You get out of the big cities, folks, there are hundreds of thousands of people who understand the Constitution, understand the Bill of Rights, understand the separation of powers, and want to fight for it. There's hundreds of thousands of people just like you. There's more people like you than there have ever been since the first American Revolution. Thank you. And you're fighting back Common Core and Agenda 21 and taking over school boards and county commissions. You're putting spine into the GOP all over the country. Look at what you've done to state legislatures. Michigan's a right-to-work state, folks. You will be too soon. You've got to keep that pressure on, folks. But you have enabled state legislatures all over this country to give the finger to the federal government. And isn't that pretty special? But that's slowing them down, folks. That's slowing down the left unbelievably. I was at a progressive I went to a progressive conference late last year in Washington, DC. 50th anniversary of the Institute for Policy Studies. They used to work with the KGB, now they work with the Cubans. They're the ideas factory of the Obama administration. And I went because I wanted to see what they're doing, what they're thinking. And I paid my 75 bucks, I put on my little badge, and I mingled with the Marxists. Okay? And I'll tell you what, folks, I got bored. Because you know what they talked about all day? Nothing but this all day. You folk. <laughs> Tea Party this. Tea Party that. They took the state legislature office. They've taken over the school boards, the county commissions. They've done 40 years of, undone 40 years of work. We've got to stop them. The Tea Party is the problem. Nothing but the Tea Party all bloody day. Yes. Hey. So, hey. Oh, oh. So folks, you're like babies who don't know your own strength. They can't pin this you, down. They can't, because you're so diverse, you know. But you have saved your country. And you've woken up hundreds of thousands of people. A bunch of novices and amateurs, most of you, have done so much. That's why I call this movement miraculous. And without, look, all over the world, people, you might not see what you've done, but there are millions of people around this planet who are watching you and watching what you're doing, because they know if you can save this country, that's going to spur us on, folks. So you are playing a big role here. Now, I'm going to do something now that's very bad manners, okay? But I'm a colonial, right? <laughs> and we don't go on manners very much, okay? Because it's not kosher to come into someone else's country and tell them what to do, is it? Bad, it's very bad. You don't go to your neighbours and tell them how to do their day court, do you? 
<laughs> but I get asked this all the time, okay? Because I see a movement that's burning out, it's burned out, a lot of tired people, a lot of frustrated people, a lot of betrayed people. Where do we go next? What do we do? Are we making a difference? What's the next step? So I'm going to give what I think you should be doing, because my only value to you is an outside perspective. Because you can always see your neighbour's problems better than you can see your own, can't you? And that's just human nature. So this is how I see things. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit in time, because I think it's illustrative. Back to 1976. You'd been losing your freedom, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, for decades. But that year, a man came out of California who saw things different, differently. Ronald Reagan came out with a message much like yours. The Constitution, American exceptionalism, a strong America, a growing economy, freedom and liberty. And it resonated, folks. Hundreds of thousands got behind him. Hundreds of thousands of people rallied to the message. And what did the Republican old guard do, folks? They hated him. They despised him. They sabotaged him. I've heard how they sabotaged him in this state. He was not allowed to come and speak in this state. But some of your old guard people, a 95-year-old woman who basically did this, they hated him. No matter how many Reagan dinners they hold today, they hated him back then. <laughs> That's true. And they just beat him. They got Gerald Ford, the Republican nomination that year. Ford went on to, to take on Carter. Jimmy Carter won. And how did those Carter years work out for you, folks? <laughs> Interest rates up to here. Gas queues around the corner. Panama, Iran. You're still suffering from it today. Now, right now, this country's Carter on steroids. Okay? And you need Reagan on steroids to turn this around. Because Reagan, th this is the important thing, folks. In 1980, the grassroots, you people, did not give up. Because you got behind Reagan again, and you got more organised, and more disciplined, and more pur purposeful, and this time you wouldn't take no for an answer. You drove them, folks. You drove them, and you forced the GOP to give them your candidate. And who was on the right side of history, people? Reagan. Who was on the right side? You were on the right side. Because he changed this country... He stood up to the Soviets, he restored your economy, and restored your pride in your country. Anybody going to argue with that? No. Look, and I'll just digress a little bit, because we, I'm always told we've got to get the young people on board, the young people in the movement. And to do that, the GOPers will tell you, we've got to get young, cool, hip candidates. We've got to, they've got to have sort of some liberal values there and nice haircuts to appeal to the young people. Because that's what young people like, right? Look, I go around my, this country all the time and I often wear my Reagan badge. I've gone to airports and I've had young 16-year-old girls with crazy goth haircuts come up to me and look at the badge and say, wasn't he great? <laughs> you know? How do you think I'd get on with a Gerald Ford badge? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you, you look at that man out of Texas, Ron Paul. I, I have disagreements with Ron on certain issues. But where's his fan base, folks? The young people love him like a chocolate. <laughs> you know? They do. And he's cool and hip and suave and liberal values and charismatic, right? He's a grumpy old bugger. <laughs> Isn't he? But the young people love him. Like they loved Reagan, because he stands up, he's consistent, he won't back down, he's principled, and he fights for the underdog and for his causes. Isn't that what the young people really want, folks? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, right now, this country is Reagan on, is, is Carter on steroids. You need Reagan on steroids to turn this around. But not just to go where Reagan did, but to go way beyond it. You need to restore your constitution and gut the federal government. You know that, folks. 
So you've got, a, you've got a huge battles in front of you. You've got 20 years, 30 years to save this country, but you've got two huge battles. Because if you don't win in 2016, folks, and they get the illegal immigrants legalised, it's going to be real tough. Real tough. Now, if I... There's only... Realistically, there's one political force that can stop the Dems in that time. Third party, there's no time for that, folks. There's one political force that can do it, like it or not. That is the GOP. But the real important thing is, what will be the character of that GOP? Will it be a Reagan GOP or a Rhino GOP? That's the real important thing. Because if they give you a Chris Christie or a Jeb Bush, you're done, folks. You will lose. And even if you fluke a win, you still lose. But if you have a man, say, of the calibre of Ted Cruz, things might be very different. So this is what I would do if I was a man like Ted Cruz. And I can't pick your people for you, but he's a front runner right now. If I was Ted Cruz, I'd want to get in early and I'd want to get that Reagan coalition assembled now. Because you need everybody, folks. Because you're going to have vote fraud and the media against you yep. and all the dirty tricks in the, under the sun. You need everyone. You need those 1% of young libertarians who voted for Gary Johnson. You need the social conservatives and the fiscal conservatives and the defence conservatives and the moderates. And you need the 2 million GOPers who stayed home last time. And you also need the 4 million evangelical Christians who don't vote. You need all of them, folks. You can't afford to turn any of them away. But how do you get them? And how do you get them united and inspired? If I was Ted Cruz, I'd do this. I'd go to them right now and I'd be saying to all these groups, because they all want something. The libertarians, they're interested in economics and the constitution. The social conservatives want something. The fiscal conservatives want something. They all want a slice of the pie. Now, I'd go to them first. I'd say, look, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put a man like Alan West on my VP ticket. Now, for you libertarians people, you vote for me this time. Rand Paul will be Secretary of the Treasury. Yeah. And he can do what he damn well wants to the Federal Reserve and the IRS. Car blanche. Yeah. And you energy voters, Sarah Palin, Secretary of Energy. Yeah. Drill, baby, drill. Drill in your backyard if you want to. John Bolton, Secretary of State. You tell him, John. Yeah. Ambassador to the United Nations, no one. <laughs> Going through it, people, Scott Walker, Secretary of Labour, yeah. right to work, right across, yeah. a right to work country. Dr. Ben Carson, yeah. Secretary of Health and Human Services. Yeah. Mark Levin, Attorney General. Yeah. And for those Christians who so love their children and their education, I'd say go to them. You vote for me this time, guys. I'm going to make Dr. David Barton Secretary of Education. You go through the whole list, folks. Would you rally to a team like that? Would you be inspired by it? Would you get your neighbours active and do everything you could to get those people in positions of authority? Yes. Is it possible? Yes. yes. It is possible, folks, because you've got the biggest base of real conservatives and patriots that's ever existed in this country. And you've got the proven leaders out there who understand what it takes to turn this country around and are willing to do it. You get the base with the leaders, folks, and you can storm this country. You can take this back. Because it's all there for the taking. How would the left react to a team like that? <laughs> what would the media do? Freak. You think about it. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You put all your eggs in Mitt Romney. He got tired with Bain Capital. It was all over. Sarah Palin was isolated and targeted and taken out. 
You try taking out a whole team of 15 or 16 hardcore people who don't take any crap from anyone. Yeah. That's what you need, folks, because you've got to go beyond Reagan. Yeah. You can't just hold the line, folks. This has got to be an attack that takes back America and gets rid of the bad guys and gets rid of the people who want to destroy your constitution. That's what it's going to take. So what I'm asking for, folks, is two and a half years. Because you've all done five years, people, and you're tired and you're burnt out, and this is a thankless, thankless task. But if you give two and a half more years, because that's going to decide the fate of your country one way or another, two and a half years, if you give it everything you can, folks, the very least I can promise you is the ability to look your children in the eye and say that I did everything I could. Is that worth something to you? And if you win, folks, and if you win, and you can win, you'll give your children not just the country you inherited, you'll give them something even better. And is that worth working for? Yes. Look, I know how tough this is, folks. This ain't an easy task. The victory is not assured by any means. But you have a chance. Get the base with the leaders. Unite. I was up in Morristown, New Jersey last year. I went to where the troops wintered in the winter of 1780. Makes this one look like paradise. Looks like Tahiti. 10,000 troops started the winter. 6,000 were there at the end. Death, disease and desertion got the rest. The officers were eating their dogs. The troops were boiling up their boots for the leather. It was pretty tough, folks. Valley Forge, every winter was tough. Seven or eight years of privation, starvation, death and disease. Being chased across virtually every state, losing way more battles than they won. A bunch of farmers and lawyers and shopkeepers and fishermen and labourers took on the greatest military empire the world has ever seen and they bloody well beat them. Yeah. How miraculous is that? Yeah. We know it was miraculous, folks. Mm -hmm. We know there was, that wasn't just the French helping them out. <laughs> Do you think the age of miracles is gone? No. No. Do you think if you strive and do everything you can to save this greatest country on the planet, you will not get help too? <laughs> do you think you've been abandoned, folks? You've just got to stand up. You'll get help from all sorts of quarters you cannot expect. All sorts of miracles are there waiting to happen. So, you think about those troops who were starving through those winters. They were starved they were chased everywhere, but they took out the British at Yorktown, folks, and they gave you the country you have today. But do you think when they were running and starving and running from the British, do you think those guys on the ground had any idea of the great country they were creating? No. no. Do you think they saw their place in history? No. Do no. no. they had any idea? No. <laughs> but they had great leadership, folks, and they had fortitude. And they prevailed. And look what they achieved. And we can see their place in history because we can look back 200 years. But what about your place in history? You look forward 200 years, folks. 200 years from now, some young kid will be up in front of a civics class in this town and he'll say to his friends, Hey guys, guess what? I discovered something really, really cool. You know how we've researched that second American Revolution, but a lot of people thought this country was done, but the Patriots stood up, and against all the odds, they restored the Constitution and saved our Republic. We know what we owe them, guys. All the freedom and prosperity we have today, we owe to what they did back then. Well, I did some research into my family background. You know what I found? I found out my great, 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 great grandma and granddaddy, they were in the Ohio Tea Party. <laughs> <laughs> so how cool is that? <laughs> so that's your place in history, folks. I just want to say to you guys, thank you so much 
for what you're doing for your country, <coughs> for my country, and for liberty. God bless America and God bless the Bay. Thank you.